Good morning, everyone. Can you, can you hear me? <clears throat> I have a bit of laryngitis, so... Not, well, yes, you can't have a bit of laryngitis. I have laryngitis. <laughs> it's not contagious, but it's, it's kind of affects my voice a little bit. <laughs> today, uh, today, your worship team is uh, taking care of your, our service, a very special service today, the, the 98th uh, Church Union Anniversary Sunday. So I'd like to welcome everyone here to our worship this morning. And as you join us either in person in our beautiful sanctuary or in the comfort of your home on Facebook or Zoom, Thank you for coming here today and worshiping, worshiping with us on this 98th anniversary of the Church's Union that was celebrated actually yesterday. Today's worship liturgy has been very graciously shared with us by Glenda Thornton, and we are grateful for her allowing us to use this today. 98 years ago, we became the United Church of Canada, and God's Spirit continues to move around us and through us and as we come together as a community, as we enter this sacred space together, building relationships with our Creator, strengthening our faith with Jesus, and feeling the power of the Holy Spirit today in this beautiful United Church of Canada. While we are centering ourselves for worship, and before we light the candles, just like Reverend Kim has been doing the last few weeks, I invite you to just close your eyes and listen to God's musics and sounds all around us. I like to, to do that at home almost every day when I have a chance. Taking a few intentional breaths, breathing in and out. <sighs> Trying to slow ourselves down, for slow our minds down so we can worship well and let the Spirit come into our, into our hearts. Yeah. It's so much easier for us to do that when we are centered a little bit by just slowing down a bit. Each new day reminds us of the light that dwells within us, the light that God has placed deep within our hearts. We light the Christ candle, remembering that we are always made of light and love, remembering that we are called to bring light and love to others and the world. Uh, many of us use candles at home as well to help center us and feel the, the spirit dwelling within us, the light of God with us. Here we also light the pride candle, and it's been beautifully taken care of by our worship team, as a celebration of all the wonderful diversity in which God creates us and calls us good. In this community of faith, we celebrate that all are welcome in this place. And as the congregation at Stairs, Memorial United Church, we acknowledge that we live, work, worship, and play within the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people as those who follow Jesus' path of peace. Together, we commit ourselves to upholding the treaties of peace and friendship so that we will live in a good way with all peoples, the land, the waters, and all of creation. We are all a treaty people, all are welcomed by God's grace. Uh, please stand if you can for our centering song. Uh, more voices, 368, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine.
a responsive call to worship. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. Let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. Breathe the Holy Spirit into every heart. Bid the fears and sorrows of each soul depart. Please be seated for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, creator of us all, we come seeking your refreshing presence in the midst of this season of summer. Like cool water or a gentle breeze, you renew us and enliven us to be your faithful community. Draw our hearts together as we come here today to worship you. Teach us your will to do, your word to speak, your song to sing, and your love to share. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Amen. I kind of feel like the uh, the Wizard of Oz, uh, the guy behind the cloud or behind the uh, curtain here. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at the the beautiful crest of the United Church of Canada, and you see it in front of us in a couple of spots on the over the uh, the lecterns. The crest of United Church of Canada is also on the bulletin today. You can look at it there. This insignia is a spiritual and historic reminder to the members of the United Church across Canada. But how much do we really know about it? How did it come to be? And what do the symbols mean? Today we will be exploring the crest, its history, and the meaning of all these symbols. The crest is the official signature of the United Church of Canada to be placed on all legal documents. It is designed by, or it was designed by Reverend Dr. Victor Mooney, who was the treasurer of the United Church at that time. In his own words, when I was appointed treasurer of the United Church of Canada, I discovered that the church had no seal to seal the documents of the church. So shortly after the 1925 union, the executive have ordered that a seal be designed for the United Church and a committee was appointed to look into it and make recommendations. However, no report was ever made to the executive. The committee had appointed an expert in seals for documents. Several designs were made, but they had not appealed to the committee at all, so they didn't present any of them. They did, however, decide that they should work into the symbols that would represent the various denominations which was into our union. Because I was always doodling at the time in the meetings, the then moderator, Dr. Slater said, let's appoint Mooney the chairman of our new committee. He's always doodling. He ought to be able to help us come up with a good design. And that was in 1943, almost 20 years later. And Mooney's design was officially adopted in 1944 by the 11th General Council. We have a hymn now. Crown him with many crowns. Voices United, number 211. Please stand.
Church of Canada. It's all Greek to me. The crest was designed in the form of a St. Andrew's cross with an insignia in each of the four corners. The X at the center represents the Greek letter Chi, which is the first letter of the Greek word for Christ. Christos, the source of the English word Christ. Because of this, the X has become a traditional symbol for Christ. In August of 2012, at the Fort First General Council, the United Church of Canada acknowledged the presence and spirituality of original peoples in the United Church by revising the church's crest. The crest changes included incorporating the colors often associated with the Aboriginal medicine wheel. The medicine wheel, which, re which reflects respect for diversity and interdependence, is often represented in the four traditional colors of yellow, red, black, and white, which incorporate important teachings from the four directions, the four stages of life, and the four seasons. The placement of these colors will vary according to the traditions of the nation. The medicine wheel teaches us to seek balance in physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the circle of life. The, the medicine wheel has always been an, an important part of my life, and I've been lucky to actually create medicine wheels in, in some of my previous properties, and it's really an important part of the tradition and we're really pleased to have it on the United Church of Canada crest. Three of the four symbols on the crest are associated with the three communions that united to form the United Church of Canada in 1925. The open Bible on the left side of the crest represents the congregational church and its emphasis upon God's truth that makes people free. From this communion, we have a heritage of liberty in prophesizing, love of spiritual freedom, awareness of creative power of the Holy Spirit, and clear witness for civic justice. These qualities all come from their history. Congregationalism began back in the time of the Puritan Reformation in Great Britain. Congregations that did not conform were still Protestant and they ran themselves independently and autonomously became known as Congregationalists. Congregationalism in Canada originated with the acceptance of the offer from the British government that promised free land for New Englanders who would relocate in Nova Scotia. In 1759, several hundred immigrants founded one founded new towns and gathered churches. The first was in Chester, and in 1760, a colony began in Malgerville in New Brunswick, with their first church being organized six years later. The churches in Newfoundland were organized in 1846, and in 1801, the British Congregationalists sent a missionary to organize a, a church in Quebec. That beginning led to the formation of the Congregational Union of Ontario and Quebec, which merged with the older Atlantic Group in 1906. It was this union of the Congregational Churches that joined the United Church of Canada in 1925. Now we have a reading from Matthew. Matthew 3, assorted verses. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. 
Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I needed to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from the heavens said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. A dove descending. The dove at the top of the crest symbolizes the Holy Spirit whose transforming power has been a distinctive mark of Methodism. Here our heritage is one of evangelical zeal, concern for human redemption, warmth of Christian fellowship, the testimony of spiritual experience, and the ministry of sacred song. The Methodist movement traces its origin to the evangelical awakening in 18th century Great Britain. Methodism followed from the work of John Wesley, who was an Anglican clergyman. Methodism in Canada is traced to Lawrence Coughlin, an Irish Methodist preacher who came to Newfoundland in 1765. Around the same time, the Methodists were migrating from England to Nova Scotia. Among them was William Black Sr., whose young son of 19 organized Methodist classes in 1781. <coughs> Three years later, Black journeyed to Baltimore, Maryland for the meeting that organized the new Methodist Episcopal Church. The Canadian work that Black had developed was taken under their care and prospered as an integral part of the Methodist Episcopal Church until 1828, when it became separate and independent. Meanwhile, Methodists from Great Britain had migrated to Upper Canada and brought with them the several divisions of British Methodism. Mergers in 1874 and 1884 resulted in the Methodist Church of Canada being formed, and this was the church that joined the United Church in 1925. Our next hymn is written by the Methodist Charles Wesley and John Wesley's brother, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, a beautiful hymn. Um, we're in uh, Voices United, number 333. Uh, please stand.
Hello, good morning. This is my first time reading. <laughs> anyway, my name is Bill Elliott, and I've been here for a long time. Okay. Um, the part five is the United Church of Canada that's on fire. But aren't we a vibrant community? We're full of love, and that's who we are. We're light and glowing with spirit. And, um, okay. The burning bush at the right of the crest is the symbol of the Presbyterianism and the indestructible of the church. From the Presbyterian, we have received a heritage of high regard to dignity and worship, education for all people, authority of scripture, and the church of, as a body of Christ. With a form of Calvin, uh, Calvinism, the Presbyterianism is a trace roots back to the Scottish Re Re Reformation of Scotland's break with the Roman Catholic Church in 1560. Later, in 1598 in France, the Edict of Nantes was issued by Henry IV to grant the Calvinists uh, Presbyterian of France, also known as the Huguenots, substantially rights of the nations still considered essential Catholic. The French Huguenots escaped prosecution followed the uh, re reformation reformation of the edict in 1685 brought, uh, brought the reformed faith to Canada. But e even in the new world, their growth and development were restricted. After Britain took over Nova Scotia in 1713, subsequent immigrants of the Presbyterian from Scotland and Ireland completely overwhelmed the, the small French contingent. Uh, the first minister from Scotland were um, Daniel Cook, David Smith, Hugh Grant, and who organized the Presbytery of Truro in, in 1786. In 1795, the Presbytery of Picto was organized, which represent another faction of the Scottish Presbyterianism. And in 1817, these two groups joined by the few ministers to establish the Canada of Scotland were able to come together and form the Synod of the Presbyterian Church of Nova Scotia. Meanwhile, the Presbyterians were moving into the central and western Canada. As in eastern Canada, they brought the many divisions of the Scottish Church with them and established several presbyteries and then synonymed to um, the first being the Presbyterian of Canada in 1818. The establishment of the new synod continued to, uh, through the first half of the 19th century, in part due uh, to the importing of a division within the Church of Scotland. The arrival of the non-English um, speaking immigrants, the Dutch Reform, and the opening of the new territories in the West. In 1875, the series of merges led to the union 
of the most Presbyterian into the Presbyterian Church of Canada. 70% 70, 70 of the congregation is in this denomination joined the United Canada in 1925. I'm reading the next scripture, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. When I'm using a, a special Bible today, um, before mom, my mother uh, moved to another apartment, she had to downsize, and she passed on this Bible to me. And uh, it's not an ordinary Bible, it's small, but it was passed on to my dad from his grandmother in, uh, in 1940, and he was 10 years old. Wow. So it was special. Wow. This is about the burning, burning bush. Okay, now Moses kept the flock of, excuse my glasses so I can see better. <laughs> now Moses kept the flock of, Je of uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led, led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Herod. And the angel of the Lord appeared upon him in the flame of the fire of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the a bush was not consumed. And Moses said, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the burn, why the bush is not burnt? And then the Lord saw that he turned aside to see. God called upon him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not thy hither, put, put off thy shoes from, from off thy feet. For the place whereon, whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. For me, it's really interesting to hear all of this history and the incredible things that happened uh, to the creation of the United Church of Canada. It must have been quite the, quite the uh, um, accomplishment back in 1925. Um, the choir has a, um, has a selection today called uh, Many and Great, O God, Are Your Works. This was uh, an old uh, Dakota Nation uh, uh, song, and uh, it has been actually translated into Cree and several other languages. It comes to us from the United Church of Christ, which is our, our counterpart in the United States. And it's been included into our, our hymnals now. So, many and great, O God, are your works.
on this uh, 98th Church Union Anniversary Sunday. We make our offering known, knowing that we have the inspiration, energy, and motivation to be here because previous generations have made this offering for us. We give to maintain our church, but even more to reach beyond in outreach for our God and humanity. Our morning offering will now be received. receive these gifts we have given God as a symbol of all that we seek to be and to be in your way offered and direct us to use these offerings for your glory and for the well-being of all for many more years to come in Jesus' name we pray amen United Church of Canada Crest, the beginning and the end. The symbols of Alpha and Omega in the lower quarter of the crest are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. They symbolize the eternal living God in the fullness of creation. And now I'm reading from the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verses 5 to 7. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Our next hymn is, uh, In Christ There Is No East or West. The voice is in it is 606. Now we've used different, uh, different melodies for this, uh, this uh, hymn before. I'm going to be playing the, uh, the original uh, African-American spiritual melody, which I, I know we've used, but uh, hopefully you'll remember it. I'll play it through once and then we'll, we'll sing. Please stand.
Gracious God, many hearts are very heavy. With all this, how do we even begin? On the cusp of continuous sunlight-filled days, we come to you, still and quiet, yet full of racing thoughts and full of prayer. On this day of union, we call to mind our ability to merge, to connect, to join. That gift you have given us, let us pray. We remember the people we know who are in trouble, those returning home, unsure of what they may see. We pray for healing and happiness for all. And it is with faith and trust that we bring you our prayers. We seek God's encouragement for honest trade and just commerce, for medicine and education, for the gifts and aptitudes in every person which serve justice and community living. We pray for peace on earth, for the generous sharing of the earth's resources and the responsible sharing of earth's problems, for understanding of others and willingness to regard the diversity of human culture as more stimulating rather than threatening. Today, in this heritage of trust, we pray for the church, the church by all its names and all its places, for its continuing usefulness as a channel of grace and hope, for its rescue from bureaucracy and stagnation, for its witness to unity and justice, for its commitment to hospitality and compassion. Oh God, as we go to our homes and our work this coming week, we ask you to send the Holy Spirit into our lives. Open our ears that may we hear what you are saying to us in the things that happen to us and the people we meet. Open our eyes so that we may see the needs of the people around us, those phoning, those lined up outside our doors on a Wednesday morning, an hour before we open. Open our hands that we may do your work well and help when needed. Open our lips so that we can tell the good news of Jesus. Bring comfort, happiness, and laughter to others. Open our minds that we may discover a new truth about you and the world. Open our hearts that may we love you and others as you have loved us. And may we live with one another in peace and respect, understanding and patience. Hear our prayers both voiced and those whispered in our thoughts. And teach us to say with conviction the words Jesus taught us. We raise them to you because you are our mother and our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I think there's some announcements. Uh, let's take a look. In our ministry, of course, we have coffee and conversation, as always, up here in our beautiful sanctuary. Uh, June 25th, an important date following service, we'll be having a congregational meeting. Um, this is a important meeting as we will be doing a vote on the Indigenous Ministries remit. Um, we ask that you review the information prior to attending the congregational meeting. Uh, it's a small information package. It's available in print over there. It's been sent out electronically every week as a link in your weekly email as well. For those of you watching from home today, if you are in need of a copy or want one sent to you, kindly call the office and we'll be happy to pass one along so you have the information. Online auction is still going strong. Thank you everyone for everything you're bringing in. We're in the collecting phase. Uh, we've got some wonderful things coming in. Uh, just recently, Trudy today gave me 
fifty dollars worth of gift cards for edna greek tavern we've got a beautiful basket that sandra got as well from waverly pharmacy there are some really great items i was actually asked this morning if we're advertising this a lot and we're not because we're waiting for everything to come in and we have a fundraising goal with the auction and i believe our goal is five thousand dollars so it's a pretty hefty one so we're still looking for some big key anchor items uh, we're asking people to do mostly retail items right now if you can by approaching businesses they'll really strengthen what we have available um what else is happening father's day service is next sunday it's going to be uh head by sandra jameson as the worship leader and other members of the ucw i believe um i would like to have a portion of worship with a, a collage of photos uh so if you'd like to pass a, along a photo of your father or a great father or any father, uh, you can email those to stairs. Uh, hopefully by Tuesday, we'd ask. Uh, we've got a few in so far. Not too many, only about five or six. But if you have one, please do. Uh, so not too much in the announcements today. Other things to mention, um, Vivian and her team that worked on the yard sale. Unbelievable how much work goes into that, how much time they commit, the setup, the teardown, the organizing, the redistribution of leftover items that they've put back into the community to help people and raising close to, I believe, Vivian, $500. I don't know the exact amount. More. Oh, so much respect, so thank you for doing that. And before I go, if anyone wants to come up, if there's any other announcements, I think. The oval shape, or you can get more of a visual maybe of a fish going that way, or a fish going this way, or a fish going up and down. The oval shape of the crest is derived from the outline of a fish, a symbol of identity adopted by the early Christians. The fish was depicted as a Christian symbol in the first decades of the second century. The symbol itself may have been suggested by a miraculous multiplication of the loaves and fishes or the meal of the seven disciples after the resurrection on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Its popularity among Christians was due principally, it would seem, to the famous acrostic consisting of the initial letters of the five Greek words forming the word fish, which words briefly but clearly described the character of Christ and the claim of believers, Jesus Christos Dehu Ihus Soter, meaning Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. The applicable reading is Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets then he got into one of the boats which was simon's and asked him to put out a little hand little from the land and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat when he had stopped speaking he said to simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which, had taken, which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. 
And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. The word of the Lord. Finally, we have some, some words on our crest. The Latin words, ut omnes unum sint, which you find on the lower side of the outline, mean that all may be one. And that's taken from John 17, verse 21, which is, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, God, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. On the lower side, we find the Mohawk phrase, Agwe nya de de ma neiren, which means all my relations. This phrase connects to Jesus' prayer and reflects the spirituality of Aboriginal peoples that acknowledges our interrelationship with all of creation. With these words on the crest, we are reminded that we are both a united and a uniting church. Our United Church of Canada, the largest Protestant denomination in Canada, was the first union of churches in the world to cross historical interdenominational lines. Along with the Congregational Church, the Methodists, and the Presbyterians, the General Synod of Union Churches from Western Canada also joined in 1925. Since then, the Synod of the Wesleyan Methodist Church of Bermuda and the Canada Conference of the Evangelical United Brethren Church have also become part of the United Church of Canada. We are also reminded that as a denomination, we always seek the right relationship among all people and with creation itself. Our crest not only reflects the history of our country, but reveals that we have come from a variety of faiths, different and dissenting perhaps, but all believing in one God, one Lord, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is Voices United, number 567. Will you come and follow me? Please stand.
For 98 years we have gathered as one. Bless us as we go from here to lives of work and worship. Let our faith be visible. Let our love be undaunted. Let our hope be unflagging as we give witness to your presence in the world. Our worship has ended and the service continues in this world as we go out in peace and hope. Our song, our dismissal today is sent out in Jesus' name. More voices, 212. <laughs>